After that wonderful worship set, I feel like saying Merry Christmas to everyone. Is it too early? Can I do that? Why not? Why not? Well, welcome to People's Church East. It's great to have all of you here today. Our vision is to be a racially reconciling, generationally rich, life-giving church thriving in Mount Washington and beyond. And our mission is to create access for all people to Jesus and his kingdom. And we're so thankful that you're here today to worship with us and be a part of this vibrant community. Because it is the Christmas time, uh, we do have a few special things coming up. The first is next week, you get to choose wherever you want to go to church. And uh, the, part of that's because the school, the, the custodians need a break, right? It's their holiday. And so we're not able to gather here at Sands Montessori. Uh, but I know People's Church Uptown is having a Christmas Eve service. And so uh, you're free to attend that and be a part of that community. And then we'll be back together on the 31st as a church. But instead of being here at Sands, we actually have uh, a little outreach center 2020 beachmont avenue the collective it's our uh, really our our place that god has blessed us within the community that we're able to do community outreach and connection with one another and so we're going to have a special time of food and fellowship at the collective from 11 to 1 and we need you to rsvp uh, for that event is there a paper sign up over there all right great and so you can do that afterwards we just need to know how many people to prepare for and uh, then we're going to do a time of prayer and fasting at the beginning of the year, January 2nd through the 6th. Is that right, Pastor Jim? So that'll be a good time. I always enjoy that, that reset and looking forward to what God's going to do in the new year. And uh, so we look forward to uh, all being a part of that together. And no matter how you can participate, uh, it's always good to do something, right? Uh, give up something and remember um, God's rightful place in our lives. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your tithes and offerings, uh, for being faithful. It's fun that our access giving supports missionaries and ministries here in the city. So thank you for your faithfulness to that. I'm going to say a prayer, and then we have special music today. That's why my voice is echoey, right? So it's about to get good. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you today uh, for your goodness. You are so faithful. You are so good. Even... Uh, those dark moments where we feel like uh, we don't know uh, what to do and we desperately need you, God. You are a way maker. You are the light of the world and you come through and show yourself faithful. So I pray for anyone today who feels in a dark place. Lord, I, I pray that you would uh, be the light that they need for strength and encouragement. Thank you for this time of worship. We just commit the rest of this church uh, worship service to you, God. We just open our hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Sweet. Now listen, it wouldn't be Christmas time if we didn't sing a Christmassy tune for you. So uh, we're going to sing a... Uh, little ditty for you and we're gonna get out of your way this is a special tribute actually to first lady kelly rally Live 
live in peace, pum pum. live in peace again. So peace to on honor him, pa rum pa pum pum, when we come. Every child must be made aware. Every child must be made to care. Care enough for his fellow man to give all that he can. For my child to see and your child too, you'll see the day of glory. You'll see the day of men of good live in peace, live in peace again. So to honor him, pa rum pa pum pum. When we come. Can it be? Amen. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Zach. Really appreciate it. All right. So, as Pastor Tom said, we're a week away from Christmas. Can you believe that? And again, this is the last time we're going to be here this year. So the next two weeks, we're not going to be here. And whether you go to Uptown on Christmas Eve or another location, please make sure to sign up for our Food and Fellowship fifth Sunday for, on the 31st. So again, the signups are, are over there. And uh, also, during that week of the 2nd to the 6th, we will be fasting. So if you've never fasted before, this is a great discipline to take on. Okay, you can start with a meal, you can try to go a whole day, you could try to go the week, right? If you're able, physically, medically, I wanna give that caveat, okay? Um, and then on the 6th, we're actually coming together as a network at 11 a.m. online, and we're gonna pray across the world for People's Church Network. So, and I'm gonna be tapping someone to pray from our church for one of our sister churches. And it's going to be Desert Church International in Dubai. So, Christmas is a week away. I said that already. But, everyone done shopping? Nope. Have you at least started shopping? I know some people like wait till the 24th to start shopping. And I just, I never got that. Right, I just, it, I, yeah, no, a little too stressful. And there's enough stress this time of the year, isn't there? I mean, this is one of the most stressful holidays on the calendar. There doesn't seem to be any time to get anything done. The demands are just too high, not just in time, but in terms of money, because so many of us want to create the perfect holiday, right? And for some, it might be that we try to do that or that others around us try to do that. And that creates stress as well, doesn't it? But is that what the season is supposed to be about? Is that what it means? We're going to wrap up our series this morning on old time Christmas. And we're going like, to look at perhaps my favorite Christmas special. And it's going to show that what many view as the perfect Christmas perfectly misses the point. So I'm sure to ruffle some feathers this morning, so let me pray before we get started. Father God, this morning, Lord, we just ask that you would just open your word to us uh, through, um, through the media that's presented here this morning. And as we look into your word, into the story, Jesus, of your coming. And Lord, we just pause in this moment to thank you for doing that, for coming and being our Savior. 
And with that, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, the Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The year was 1965, and it was a time when the civil religion, which are those rituals, symbols, and traditions that define a nation, still held sway, not just in the public square, but in the media as well. But there were signs that year that something was happening and there more needed to be done. You see, 65 was a consequential year, and Christian and I were talking about this this week, that we didn't realize how consequential a year 1965 was. It followed on the heels of 1964, which is when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law. And in December of that year, Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize. And in his acceptance speech, he talked about the end of the long night of injustice. But during that year, we saw that things weren't quite right because it led to, there was violence that led to the marches from Selma to Montgomery, as well as the riots in the Watt section of Los Angeles. And although we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and and in 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, these incidents showed that while there was progress being made, many in society were still held captive by faulty thought systems and biases that even today still haunt us. There were other things that were happening during that time too. The U.S. was becoming increasingly involved in Vietnam. From some CIA and Green Beret resources, we saw a drum up of the troops. And during that time, we also saw on college campuses, we saw the spread of a seductive lie that was being taught in the schools of a worldview that is inimical to what Abraham Lincoln in his inaugural address referred to as the better angels of our nature. So by the end of the year, the country needed a break. And that December, that break came in the form of America's favorite lovable loser, his dog, and his friends. Charlie Brown was the creation of Charles Schultz in 1950. Charlie Brown was the everyman, right? And he was more prone to failure than success, which is what drew people to him. And when it started, it just started in seven newspapers. But over the years, driven in large part due to the holiday specials that we, that we see every year, it became the most popular comic strip of all time. And by the time Charles Schultz passed away in the year 2000, it's estimated that the Peanuts, as the strip was named, was being seen in over 2,600 newspapers in 75 countries and 21 different languages. And so part of that was a Charlie Brown Christmas, and it aired on December 9th, 1965. And as an observer and chronicler of society, Charles Schultz noted that there was something lacking in the celebration of Christmas. What was lacking was the very reason for the season. It had been replaced by a crass commercialism that grew up after the war. And so Charles Schultz, when he was approached on producing a Christmas special by his producers, Lee Mendelson and Bill Melendez, he said, it has to be about something. It has to have the true meaning of Christmas in there. And he said, otherwise, why bother? And his producers asked him, they said, are you sure you want to have the Bible in this special? And his response was, if we don't do it, who will? And so they produced this special. And to their credit, the sponsors, Coca-Cola, and the network, CBS, didn't even balk at this. They didn't even blink at it. They said, go ahead, run with it. And what happened was amazing. Linus's reading of the Advent story from Luke 2 became the most magical two minutes of animated history. 
And by the time the year was over, and next year in the award season, a Charlie Brown Christmas won an Emmy, it won two Peabody's, and on its initial debut, it captured a 50 share. When you think about share in terms of television, the only things that have exceeded that are Super Bowls and the final episodes of some of the most long-running series on TV. The number one is MASH, for those who remember that show, right? But before we watch that scene, I want to set the scene up. When this starts, Charlie Brown is walking with his friend Linus, and they stop and they're leaning on a, a wall. And Charlie Brown says, I think there must be something wrong with me, Linus. Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. I just don't understand Christmas, I guess. You see, I like getting presents and sending Christmas cards and decorating trees and all that, but I'm still not happy. I always wind up feeling depressed. And for 1965, that was a stunning admission on TV. Mental health was something you didn't talk about back then. But he wasn't alone. The holidays impact mental health greatly. A survey by the National Alliance on Mental uh, Illness says that two-thirds of, of people with a health challenge noted that their symptoms worsen during this time of year. And across the general population, over a third, almost 40% of people will say, you know what, this time is way too stressful. People get overwhelmed. They're trying to accomplish too much. They're trying to please everyone. And they're setting unrealistic expectations. And to be sure, there are external pressures, right? For those of us who have families in other areas of the country, there's pressure to travel, isn't there? For those of us who have kids, the pressure to buy the perfect gift creates financial pressures. And then, of course, there are the family pressures, right? Families put the fun in dysfunction, right? We know that. But it can create stress. And another thing that creates a tremendous amount of stress for many people is loneliness. So, what can we do? What can we do to improve our mental health during this season? Well, there's a few things I want to uh, talk about today. The first is, set realistic expectations. Ask if you're expecting too much from yourself. Also ask if you're expecting too much from others. Right? That's healthy, is to realize if we're expecting too much from other people and to expect too much from ourselves and see how those expectations are making us feel. Are they helpful or are they stressful? Chances are there's a lot of stress there. The next thing is to learn to say no. That's hard in our society, isn't it? But you're only one person. There's only so much any one of us can do at any one point in time. So we need to remind ourselves at some point that it's okay to say no. Another thing is in these expectations is don't fall into the comparison trap, right? Social media is great at connecting with people you hardly knew to begin with, but it's also one of the worst things that you can look at if you want to get into what's called the comparison trap because you're looking at pictures that people are posting of themselves that are only there to make themselves look good. They're not po posting bad hair days if they have hair, right? But, you know, so stay away from social media. Find activities, winter activities to enjoy. And I was gonna talk about skiing and sledding and that kind of thing. Well, I don't think we're gonna have that problem here this Christmas. That's okay, I'm not, I'm not, our, uh, you know, I'm not complaining about that. So don't forget about you. Take the time to be by yourself and engage in some self-care rituals. One thing, I mean, you know, if, if, if you're ever wondering what to get me, a massage is great, right? I enjoy that. Um, so take time for yourself. Take time to care for yourself. But don't forget to take time to care for others also. 
because there are people who rely on us. There are people who we normally have a life-giving relationship with that might need our help. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. Charlie, oh, Charlie Brown always had Linus. And if we look in scripture, Linus is Charlie Brown's Barnabas. He's always there to encourage Charlie Brown. He's the voice of reason in the peanuts. And if none of that helps, talk to somebody. Find someone, a qualified professional, to talk about these things with. Because stress, anxiety, depression be can, can become overwhelming. And if you're dealing with those things, talking to a qualified professional can help in terms of giving you tools, giving you things that you can do that can help alleviate some of that. Now, we know that Charlie Brown had Lucy as his psychologist, right? If you've ever read The Peanuts. Let's face it, she wasn't qualified, and she certainly wasn't any help, right? And that's why he had Linus. Linus kept him off the edge. But one other thing to do is to remember the reason for the season. Remember why we have this holiday. And in the special, Charlie Brown is going to get a Christmas tree for the high school play. He's the director of the play, and he's like, okay, I'm going to go get a Christmas tree so that we can enjoy it. And when he goes to look at the trees, this was the age of the artificial aluminum Christmas tree. And some people in the back know what I'm talking about, you know, and they were all different colors. You had pinks, you had blues, you had surf green, you had all sorts of stuff, and they were interesting, right? And he just was, he just said, I can't do this. And so what, he, what does he do? He finds the humblest little Christmas tree, and he takes it back to the school. And the response from people there, it was a little less than enthusiastic, wasn't it? And so what follows is actually the ultimate scene in the, in the, in the special. Linus comes out and recites the Advent. We're going to look at that from Luke 2. I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Linus is right. I won't let all this commercialism ruin my Christmas. I love that scene. But there's a few observations I want to make about both Linus and Luke from, from this scene. And the first is the audience. In verse 8 of Luke 2, we see that the shepherds are out tending the sheep. And the shepherds are on the margins of society. They had a rough job. They got into things that would make them ceremonially unclean. So they were kept from temple worship a lot of the time. And so they were on the margins. But this is who Jesus came for. Jesus came for the last, the least, and the lost, the ones who we wouldn't think of, right? James, in his letter, says that true religion is about the widow and the orphan. And that's who we serve. People's Church especially focuses on the foster and adoptive communities to serve those who need the assistance in order to have a viable family. And also, what you have is you have Linus during that scene as the teacher. He was being a pastor to his friends at that point, wasn't he? And he got up and he, and he gave such a great speech, reading from the Gospel of Luke. The second observation is the assertion. What was the response of the shepherds? They were frightened. What did the angel say? He said, fear not, right? Don't be afraid. And we look at Linus, and Linus is known to be somewhat timid. You always see him with his blanket. His blanket is what defines him, right? To him, it signifies safety. It signifies security. It's a shield of his, right? And Peanuts, the strip, shows several instances where Linus is without his blanket for a while. And what happens? He loses his mind. He freaks out. And you can see there's a couple pictures of, of one of those instances on there. But when he gets up to tell the story of the birth of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke... There comes a point where he drops his blanket and we witness a transformation in Linus. When does he drop his blanket? It's when the angels say, fear not. Linus transforms and he's not this frightened little boy, but he's a stoic sage. He stands there and he gives the Advent story and he gives a lesson to his friends that they sorely needed after how they picked on Charlie Brown. And not only that, he goes from protecting himself with his blanket, his shield, if we think about the book of Ephesians, which is a defensive <coughs> weapon, and he arms himself with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It's, I never really thought about that until I read some of the commentaries. I'm like, that's incredible that they would think of doing that. And then we go to the announcement. The angel says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. We think that's a quaint story, right? It helps to set context but the thing is, the shepherds knew exactly what was being said. This was an answer to 3,500 years of prayer, going right back to the garden, and more than 1,500 years of prophecy that the Messiah would come. It was also a herald against the worldly powers. When the angel says, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. There's two 
theologians, their names are Marcus Borg and John, uh, John Dominic Crossan, and I normally wouldn't quote from them, but they wrote a book called The First Christmas. And they point out the subversiveness of what the angel was actually saying. You see, in Rome, the Caesar, the emperor, was Lord. He was the son of Jupiter. He was the son of God. He was the bringer of peace, and he was the savior of the world. Those were the titles that were ascribed to Caesar Augustus, who was in charge at that time. So the angel coming and saying those things were a direct challenge to the Roman Empire. And for us, it's a reminder that the events that set our redemption in motion that long ago happened in what we now call the now but not yet of our state between now and when Jesus comes back, right? And it's a call to choose between earthly safety that's provided by our government, provided by our ruler, or choose peace and salvation as provided by our creator and sustainer. And with any response, there's an action. We go into verse 13 and beyond, and what we see next is suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when we think about this, when we think about what this, what this looks like, we, I don't think we necessarily have a full appreciation because when it says a great company of the heavenly host, a company from a military standpoint is about 150 to 200 soldiers, right? So you have a company of angels of the heavenly host and the host is innumerable in heaven and they are there singing. Can you imagine what that sounded like? That's incredible. And they praise God. And they say, peace to those on whom his favor rests. His favor rested upon his people. His people were Israel. But his people were also us. Because there's always a future fulfillment in prophecy. And the shepherds have a reaction also. And they say, well, let's get on up out of here right? Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that happened, which the Lord told us about. And look at that. They don't say the angel, they say the Lord. They knew where this message was coming from, and they wanted to make sure that they were a part of that. And likewise, Charlie Brown, when he's hit with the gospel, when he's hit with the reason for the season, he ignores his detractors, and he picks up his tree and he says, you know what? I'm going to go decorate it. It's a nice little tree. It's a good little tree. And he re is reminded of the herald that the angel brought. I bring you good tidings of great joy. So this season, fear not. Right? Jesus tells us not to fear in the Gospels. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about next Monday or next Sunday evening if you have family events or any time during this week. Don't worry about it. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We can only take the next step in front of us. So we want to choose joy. And we do that by setting realistic expectations, by learning to say no, don't compare yourselves to other people, don't forget yourself, don't forget others, and above all else, talk to somebody if you need to. But always remember the reason for this season. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you, he is the Messiah, the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we just pause to thank you for your word. We pause to thank you for loving us so much 
that you would send your son. We thank you that you love us so much that you would make sure that we have your word so that we might know about you. Jesus, this morning we just bow before you and we thank you for coming, for saving us, for providing a way, for being our advocate, and for making sure that whatever is to come, we know our future is secure because we love you, we follow you, you are our Lord and Savior. And we give our week to you, we give ourselves wholly to you this day and every day. And it's for your sake and your name that we pray. Amen. Now if you all rise, Amanda will come and give the benediction. Is this one still? Yeah, it is on. Cool. All right. Before I do the benediction, we have one little thing that I got to do. So if you want to sit down, you're more than welcome to. But this will just take a minute. So, pastors and their wives carry an incredible weight that many of us will never understand. The role of pastor demands commitment to their whole self, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physical, physically. It can also be a lonely time as you navigate how to both lead a congregation and take part in its fellowship. Pastors and their wives need our prayer, our commitment, our support, and our appreciation. So Pastor Jim and Kelly, could you come up here for just a hot second? <laughs> All right. I didn't plan the transitions. <laughs> All right. So Pastor Jim and Kelly, we as the congregation appreciate everything that you do to care for the church from visits to the hospital, to picking up donuts for Sunday morning, to spiritually leading us. Thank you for your example of living a life of faith. Jim, we especially thank you for infusing your, your sermons with lighthearted references to Patriots football and plentiful <laughs> movie quotes and your holiday themed outfits. We know that the last year has been filled with transitions and uncertainty, and we are so thankful that you took a leap of faith to follow God's leading to East. I know for me personally, your shepherding has encouraged me to take deeper dives in both the Bible and in prayer, and to think more critically about surrendering to Christ in all areas of my life. I'm sure that countless people in the congregation can say the same. So we have a small gift to celebrate the two of you this Christmas season to affirm your overwhelming, and to affirm our overwhelming gratitude to you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you make me cry too. Thank you all so much. It's been a wonderful year, and I'm looking forward to seeing what God does with us in the next year, right? So, um, but, oh, there's one thing I forgot to talk about. So, <laughs> this morning, Ms. Sharon came in, and she had a card from her class, and they all signed it. They put their thumbprints on the card to just thank her, to thank her for being here, to thank us for being here. So, your love matters. Have a great Christmas. That was the benediction. <laughs> <laughs>